Brilliant. Hey, Ian. I'll just let it, people load in here now. And we'll Wait. Yeah. Up. Thanks for joining. Now, people are flying into us here now, so I'm just going to wait for everybody to load in and then we'll start the session. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Great stuff. How are you doing? Hello, hello and welcome. Thank you all very much for joining us on this webinar today with our UCD tutor Anlo Neil. Anlo is probably more well known for his lecture series in our lifelong learning program, Walks and Talks. Anlo will explain the ins and outs of Walks and Talks throughout this session here now. Um, but it's a, lovely, it's a lovely class. Basically, you go in and you do your classroom bits on a Thursday and then you discover all the places that you speak about on Thursday on Saturday mornings with Walks through Dublin. Our lifelong learning program offers a wide range of courses um, from history, art appreciation, psychology, a whole kit and caboodle. Um, lifelong learning are just for interest courses. So unlike a lot of the bits, like, like, unlike a lot of the courses in UCD, there's no assessment required. So it's just purely for passion and it takes place in a number of venues across Dublin, from UCD itself over to Dunleary, the library and the lexicon, and then all the way over to Collins Barracks and places in between. So thank you again so much for joining us. This is our first taster session on Zoom, so fingers crossed all goes well. It's been, um, Zoom has been interesting to get used to, so I'm sure we'll have a great session here with Anna. You'll see on your menu bar below that there is a questions and answers box. Please feel free to submit any questions throughout the session, and myself and Anna will go through them at the end. Um, and if you have any questions at all, well, you can, you can contact me throughout the session on that. But I think we'll kick it off, Anna, will we? Great, thank you. Thanks, right. Enya. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is very strange for me because I'm used to seeing faces that I'm talking to. I can't see any of your faces, but hopefully you can see mine. And I'd like to welcome you all very much. I know there are some people who I'd call returning victims, people who did the, cost, they did the courses before and uh, are, are uh, uh, logging in today, and they are very, very welcome. Welcome back, old friends. Um, so unfortunately, I can't see your faces. And to anybody who is just uh, seeing me for the first time, I'd just like to welcome you along. And I hope that in the next 50 minutes or so that uh, I'll give you a, a taste of what the uh, course is like. It's been running now for over 20 years, so we must be doing something right with adult education uh, to, to keep people in twos and so on. The first thing I'd say to you, everybody is that when you go abroad, well, when we used to be able to go abroad on weekend trips or whatever to Prague or to Krakow or to, to, to Paris or wherever, one of the first things we do is we buy a guidebook. We would visit the various churches and historic buildings and so on. And we might even take a walk. And we often take our own city for granted and we don't do these things. We just, you know, use the city as somewhere to shop or to make appointments with people to, to, you know, to do business and so on. But we don't actually look, st stand back and look at it. And it's a fantastic city. It's a wonderful city. It's, there's been a settlement here since the middle of the ninth century that we know about, an, an organized settlement. Um, and that's thanks to our pals, the, the Vikings. Now, there was a small settlement before that um, on, around the, uh, the uh, Arclea, the old uh, ford across the river. But it was really the, the Vikings that, that established Dublin as such. And another thing I'll always say to people, as well as, you know, this is your city, go out and discover it. Another thing I'd say to you is that from the beginning, you have to emphasize that the history of Ireland is not the history of Dublin. That Dublin has a sort of a unique place in history because when you think that the, the whole of Ireland wasn't probably col properly colonized until the start of the 17th, or probably into the middle of the 17th century, Whereas Dublin was very, very much part of the European diaspora, the, 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 the whole, uh, and later the, the, the sort of the, the crown lands, if you like, of uh, Britain and Ireland. So Dublin developed its own unique history, its own unique character. 
uh, and that's that's a very important thing. So often things that went on in Dublin didn't largely affect the rest of the country for, for centuries. And conversely, things that happened in the rest of the country didn't really affect Dublin that much. So as the course goes on, uh, that becomes more and more apparent. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to switch to a PowerPoint presentation. And basically what it does, it'll, it'll bring you through the, the bones of the course. Now, there are two courses. The first course is a history of Dublin through walks and talks. And that's the one that I'm, that I'm focusing on today. The second course is more walks and talks that takes place after Christmas. And what that does is that course takes up five themes uh, that I couldn't fully cover in, in the, the walks and talks course because we only have five weeks to cover about 1,200 years of history. As you can imagine, you can't go into detail in every particular topic you'd like. So it, it picks out topics that were of particular interest to people and we develop them more in the, in the, in the second course after Christmas and that involves five walks as well. But this uh, presentation is really based on the history of Dublin through walks and talks and the, um, spring, and the autumn course. So I'm just going to take that up now. I hope you can all see that. Anya might tell me if you can see that. Is that clear? It hasn't Anya? come up yet, Anna. Has that come up now? Not yet. Okay. Just bear with me one second, folks. Anna, take your time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think that's coming up now, and it should come up now in a minute. Hundred percent. We're that's great. You yeah, have that now. That's brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Okay, there we are. Okay, we have that. That's it. It's on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anya. Just checking there with Anya to see that it was coming up. Okay, so the course outline. We start with basically the arrival of the Vikings, uh, the big flotilla of Vikings. That's presumed to have come in around into Dublin and around the year 841 AD. Uh, and the, the, this, was, this was a major thing because we reckon that there were, there were probably hundreds of Viking ships that actually came in. Uh, they, they, picked the, the, they picked the site in Dublin because of the, the confluence of the, uh, the river uh, Poddle and the uh, incoming tide from the Liffey from uh, Liffey mean tidal, which formed the, the Black Pool. Now, the Black Pool has been, I'm delighted to say from my point of view, has been in the news a lot lately because they've uh, a lot of excavation being done around Ship Street, and they've discovered that the, the Dove Ling, or the, the Black Pool, as they called it, was much bigger than we actually originally thought. So it, it, it adds a little bit more spice to my walks. And um, so the, arri the arrival of the Vikings is the first element we talk about, like, as I say, why they picked Dublin and so on, and how they established themselves and established a settlement. And the Vikings first thing when they, when they, when they arrived anywhere, when they had sort of got beyond their sort of piracy stage of just hit and run, if you like, of hitting monasteries, pillaging them, taking slaves, making slaves of the monks, taking their, their, their booty away with them. When they came to the idea of settling somewhere, they picked somewhere that could be, number one, could be easily defended. And number two, that was close to the sea, that if there was an attack from land, that they would be able to escape quite quickly. And it comes, into, it comes in, the, in, in our story that in two, in two cases, they did have to make a quick exit from Dublin, but then came back a third time to reestablish their settlement. And it shows how important Dublin was to them, that they would come back a third time and not just abandon the, 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 the whole area. And that of course, led then to the expansion of the city from roughly the site of Dublin Castle and worked down towards the River Liffey and the development of Wood Quay. And Wood Quay, of course, as we know, uh, is in the minds of everybody uh, because of the excavations when the um, Dublin Corporation were building those wonderful uh, blocks. Uh, when the excavation, luckily, the, the, arche the archaeologists were able to get in and get, get, get a, lot of, a lot of material out. Uh, before the 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 uh, the, the uh, buildings were were constructed, and what it showed was that Wood Key was not just a small key, but it was something that ran along right along the whole um, length of the settlement in Dublin, and it was a major importing exporting area. 
and led to the development and the, the growth and wealth of Dublin and also to the interest in people from the hinterland, Irish people coming in and uh, you know making Dublin their home and trading with the Vikings and so on. And this led to what we know as the Hiberno Norse, where the, the, the Vikings intermarried with the local Irish people and the, after, after a century or so, it became indistinguishable whether a person was Nor Norwegian or Danish or whatever, or had the really Irish stock, because the blood had been mixed so much. This society then became very organized. It became very peaceful. Uh, it was not under attack anymore from the surrounding Irish chieftains. So it led to a great growth in, in, in wealth in Dublin and a huge growth in international trade in the Viking world. And we, when you consider the Viking world ran from the tip of the tip of Norway, all the way down uh, through the uh, Bay of Biscay, down around the Straits of Gibraltar, into the Mediterranean, into the Black Sea, and up the rivers into what we now call Russia. It, you can see that, that, that it, was, it was actually larger than, much larger than the Roman Empire was. And to think that Dublin was, one of the major centers of that just shows the importance of Dublin and how interesting um, the history of Dublin at that stage was. The next thing we move on to then is the arrival of the Normans, and this was a huge upheaval. Because with the arrival of the Normans, unlike the Vikings who arrived, made a settlement, and basically uh, cooperated with the, 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 the local people in the, in the Arclea settlement, and led to the sort of convergence, if you like, of the, the Dovling settlement, the Viking settlement, and the Irish settlement in uh, Arclea, that it merged to form what we know Dublin and as Dublin and what the Vikings would have called Difflin. The Normans were a very different kettle of fish because when the Normans arrived, they arrived to a, I call it a walled city, though actually the, 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 the walls weren't actually made of stone. They were, there were wooden walls and ramparts. So they arrived to a sort of a, a ready-made settlement, if you like, and they set about very quickly expelling the Herberno Norse from that, from that area. So it very quickly became a very Norman town. The Herberno Norse were tolerated during the day because they, 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 they provided services. Um, they were, did the, 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 the jobs that the Normans themselves didn't want to do and so on. But once the curfew bell rang, the Herberno Norse were uh, were expelled and they'll be coming back to that in, in, in a later point. So the, the Normans consolidated their power in and around Dublin. They very quickly uh, established Dublin Castle as the centre of power and Dublin Castle carried a resonance right on to 1922 as we know and you know the, uh, the history of Ireland and even the, the film Michael Collins brings out that point um, when Collins comes to take over the, the uh, control of Dublin Castle from the British authorities. So Dublin Castle be, became more than just a, a series of buildings. It became sort of, it, it became entrenched in the psyche of Irish people that it was the, it was the centre of power for a, a foreign power, if you like, an occupying power. Because that's what the Normans were, an occupying power. They made no attempt to to integrate with the local people. They had to trade with them from necessity, but that was about all it was. And when the Herberno Norse were um, expelled from the precincts of the city, they moved across the river. They moved to the north side and they, they, they formed the area called Oxmanstown. Now Oxmanstown that we know nowadays is a very small part of what was the original Oxmanstown. Oxmanstown was basically the town of the, of the, the, the east, people from the east, if you like. And it, it, it covered everything on, the, on north of the Liffey. So the people that were expelled, they were, they were people, they, 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 they weren't uh, impoverished refugees because there were people, there were, there were craftspeople, there were tradespeople, there were people who traded with abroad and so on, there were shipbuilders, they had all the skills, there were farmers and so on. So what they did was they set up, if you like, a counterculture in Oxford Sounds, a very interesting aspect of, of Dublin history that you had these two sides and probably uh, led to the, 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 the sort of chasm, if you like, between Northsiders and Southsiders that, that still uh, exists in a jocular manner to this day. I won't tell you which side of the Liffey I'm from. Okay, so we move on then to um, 
as the Normans became more established and so on, and we 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 uh, drift into the idea of not being a, a Norman city, but being a, a, an English city, if you like, or a British city, that Dublin was a very, very important place as an English power base. Dublin Castle was, was uh, the walls were, were um, then built of stone. The uh, various towers in the castle and so on were constructed. And the, it, it became not just a, a place of, 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 of uh, power from the point of view of a military strength, but also from a political strength. And as the expansion of the, the, the British rule spread to the rest of Ireland and to other towns in Ireland, it became a very, very important headquarters, if you like, and a base for that. Now, that necessitated, of course, the expansion of the city beyond the walls. And that's an interesting area, too. What we'd call the, the nowadays we'd call them sort of the inner suburbs of Dublin, the, the area around uh, James's, James's Street, around the, 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 the Patrick's Cathedral, over around by um, Grafton Street, you know, uh, out as far as um, maybe Baggett Street and so on. That whole area there became a sort of, a, if you like, an Anglo Irish uh, area. And people were encouraged to come from England and settle there because th th there was obviously uh, always a, a fear and a, a very justifiable fear that if you were the Irish I living in the environs of the, of the old walled city, that there was always a, a chance that a, a tax would be made on them. And attacks indeed were made by the O'Burns and the O'Tools at many, many stages or at this stage from the Wicklow Mountains. Now this area, this 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 area of the, of the course, goes on for through a number of, of, of kings, a number of, of, of dynasties, and so on, uh, until we come to a, a very turbulent uh, period of Irish history, and which really started with the Silk and Thomas Rebellion, and the Silk and Thomas Rebellion was centered around Dublin Castle and so on, and it's a very interesting story and so on. And it, 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 was, it really showed the British crown, the English crown, that Henry VII and later Henry VIII, that this was, that Dublin was a place uh, that, that, that although it, it, was, it was powerful, it was well defended and so on, that it was still quite vulnerable to uh, anybody in, in England who had, a, who had an interest in usurping the crown or had a, a, a history of disloyalty to the crown, that Ireland was, Dublin especially, was being seen as sort of a backdoor uh, for a, a tax on the, on the crown. And this became very, very important later on again. And th then we move on to a, another upheaval, of course, the, the Reformation in Dublin. Because now with the Reformation, be, be prior to the, the schism between Henry VIII and the, the church in, in, in Rome, everybody was, was a, 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 a Catholic a member of the Catholic Church and so on. But now, uh, all of a sudden, people have to decide. And if you decided that you were going to keep with the Catholic religion, you were not only saying that you, were, um, that, that you weren't recognizing uh, the, the Protestant faith, but you were actually saying that you weren't recognizing your monarch as the head of the church. So that then gave the, the monarch uh, the, the, the right then to confiscate your property, to confiscate your titles, to... Uh, to bring in laws that that you know you 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 couldn't um, you couldn't uh, take certain offices and so on within the administration. So that was a huge upheaval in Dublin, and led to the sort of the idea of the sort of that led right into the into the twentieth century the idea of the Protestant elite that that ruled Dublin that the minority was ruling the majority, and it was much more pronounced in Dublin than it was in in, in the rest of the country. We lead them to Elizabethan Dublin, and Dublin at this stage, you know, I said at the beginning that. Um, we have to put out of our mind that the history of Dublin is the history of Ireland. But in Elizabethan times, Dublin was used very much as the base for the um, final uh, conquest of the rest of Ireland, especially Munster and Ulster, and bring them more under the control of the crown. So Dublin was used as sort of a power base uh, from, 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 and Cork to a lesser extent, from whence troops and so on and spilled out into the into the, the 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 various rebel areas they saw, and led eventually then to the, the what we call the flight of the earls. Now moving again then into the 17th century, of course, the the, the time of great upheaval in in England itself, with the English Civil War. And um, the the 
what we'd call now at this stage the the old English or the Anglo Irish, if you like, in in Ireland, stayed loyal to largely stayed loyal to uh, the the crown to Charles the first, which led them into conflict, of course, with the with the uh, parliamentarians, and we know about the about the uh, Cromwell and uh, his legacy in Ireland. Again, there was a very different legacy in Dublin as there was in the rest of the country, um, because uh, Dublin was seen by Cromwell as being, of which it was, loyal to the king. So his idea was that he was going to humiliate the citizens of Dublin from the, from the, 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 the high clergy and the, the Lord Mayor of Down, if you like, and he, he really wanted to 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 make Dublin into a backwater to to sort of punish it if you like for its support of the of the king. Now luckily all that changed from Dublin point of view with the restoration in 1660 of Charles II. And this led to a renaissance. So we're coming to a nice nice period of, 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 of Dublin history, a happy period if you like of Dublin history, from the point of view that the Duke of Ormond, who had been the Charles I Viceroy, and remember the Viceroy was very important because the Viceroy was the most important person in Ireland. They were called Lord Lefton, they were called Viceroy, they were called, called various uh, titles over, over the, the, the period of, of British rule. But they were basically the King's representative or the Queen's representative in Ireland, and they were, they were all powerful. The Duke of Ormond and the Ormond family being so important, the Duke of Ormond was made the uh, Viceroy for Charles I. And Charles II had the good sense to reappoint him when he came because the Ormonds had a very good knowledge of Dublin and good interest in Dublin. And a huge amount of money was, was, was uh, poured into Dublin to, in, a, in a way to reward it for its, 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 uh, its loyalty to, to Charles I and its stand against, against Cromwell. So we had the development of the North Keys, we had the development of the, of the um, Stevens Green, we had a uh, money put into the Phoenix, uh, the well, the Phoenix Park was was uh, d developed as a hunting ground, a royal hunting ground, and a huge amount of of, of inward investment, we'd call it nowadays, came from um, the the, the K king's associates, so where business people were encouraged to come over and set up businesses in Dublin. So it led to a great renaissance in in trade and so on. Now, leading then on to later in the 17th century, we come to another period of upheaval, what we call the War of the Two Kings. Um, the, the, the war, uh, which was sort of a, a proxy war that was fought in Ireland between James II and uh, William, uh, William of Orange, as he was known. Now, that uh, led to the famous battles of, uh, the famous battles of the Siege of Derry, the Battle of the Boyne, uh, the, the Siege of Athlone, and the, the ultimate uh, victory of William of Orange at the Battle of Ockram. Uh, it's always one of these quirks in history that the Battle of the Boyne, I suppose because of the resonance for, for, for Unionists in the North, that it gets precedence over what was the decisive battle, the, the Battle of Ockram. Um, again, there was, there, there was a, 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 a big connection uh, between Dublin and the, uh, and the, the War of the Two Kings because uh, it stayed loyal, Dublin had stayed loyal to, to James II for all his flaws and uh, he famously fled back to England from or back to the, uh, to the continent in exile uh, after the Battle of the Boyne through, through Dublin. Now what that meant for Dublin was then, the next section talking about William of Orange and Dublin, what that meant was that as Cromwell had punished uh, Dublin for its loyalty to Charles I, the Williamites, now not per William of Orange personally, because he was very little interested in Dublin, but the Williamites themselves as supporters were awarded for, for their, their um, loyalty and so on and for, and for fighting this cause by being given the um, businesses and the houses and so on of the dispossessed Jacobins. And a lot of the Jacobins actually, the, the followers of James II actually fled to the continent and so on. And so there, be, there came a huge resentment to the arrival of these largely Dutch merchants, business people and so on, because they came in with their own um, systems of trading and with their own networks of trading as well, which obviously were more concentrated in what they call the low countries, uh, to the detriment of a lot of the, the, the uh, business links that had been built up between, between Dublin and, 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 uh, and England and Britain generally. 
Now, leading them through the uh, in, into the the later it's at the, the middle of the of the seventeenth century, the eighteenth century. Sorry, we come to what Dublin is probably most famous for the Georgian era and the Georgian Dublin. Now, one of the things about to be said about Georgian Dublin is that, and I know this is uh, it's not just my opinion; it's a, it's an actual fact that Georgian Dublin has got the finest collection of Georgian buildings. Not only Georgian buildings, but Georgian railings, and even down to the coal, coal hole covers, the original ones, of any city in, in Europe. And the reason for that is, is we never suffered aerial bombardment. It's as simple as that. We didn't, we weren't, well, we had some bombing in the North Strand and so on in the Second World War, but nothing like the, the British cities and so on. And even from the point of view of the railings, that most of the railings, the ones that hadn't been taken and melted down for armaments in the First World War, were dispatched in the Second World War, as were a lot of the coal hole covers. So Dublin is a, is a wonderful city for to, to and it's for, from the point of view of my point of view of, of walking Dublin, it's the easiest walk for me to do because it's it's just there. I, I don't have to say very much because it's it's in front of you if you like. Every, everything is in front of you, the architecture, the history, and so on. So George and Dublin was uh, now, of course, this the the the, the Renaissance in Dublin was very very obvious for the elite but what it did was it, it 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 widened the chasm between the very wealthy and the very poor because the very wealthy were making huge huge amounts of money on property deals and banking and as as, as it was has been highlighted lately on in the slave trade because a huge amount of the of the um the the, the large uh, landowners in dublin were people who were involved in making money from slavery, especially in the West Indies and so on. So a lot of George and Dublin, unfortunately, was built on that. It's just one of the, 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 the tragedies of history uh, that, that the, the, the money that they made on, um, on their general trading um, went into George and Dublin. But the populace, uh, the people, that, I feel like, that lived behind the George and facades, they were people who were getting further and further mired into, into debt and poverty and degradation and so on. And unfortunately, after the, the Act of Union in 1800, this continued, and it, the, with the, the, the removal of the, of the two Houses of Parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, to London, it, not only did, was it a physical move, if you like, but it was also a huge move of capital, because a lot of the people who, especially the people who sat in the Lords in Dublin, they no longer saw a need to maintain a house, in, in Dublin, they, they kept their, their estates in, 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 in rural Ireland because they were obviously making money from them, from the rents, but they saw no future in keeping their houses in, uh, in Dublin city. So they, a lot of them re relocated with government help to uh, London and to other, uh, other British cities, with the result that we had the rise of the tenements, especially in, in, within the, the north inner city, but in the south inner city as well in areas. Where the uh, where one family had lived in a in a large Georgian house, you know, it may be up to 18, 19 families living in these these rooms in appalling conditions, with one tap in the yard and no uh, proper sanitary facilities. And one of the things that that that's very very obvious, and especially in early nineteenth century Dublin, is the the huge scale of of disease like like cholera, typhus, and so on and the huge infant mortality rates. And it was simply because uh, of the, 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 the lack of investment, the, um, the fact that, that uh, so much capital, if you like, and money had been taken out and wealth had been taken out of Dublin and had been re relocated to London. Just one figure to, to give you is that it, it's reckoned that, and this is by 1800 figures, that in 1800, um, when the Lords relocated to uh, Westminster from the Dublin Parliament, that £600,000 sterling, now this is in, in 1800 figures, was lost annually to the Dublin economy. So you can imagine if that, if you, if you extrapolate that to the modern times when you're talking about billions, if billions, we're talking now at the moment about the hit that the economy is taking, but if you can imagine the billions are just removed every year for every year, you know, as through our lifetimes from Dublin, the effect that that would have had. So you can see how Dublin suffered so much, especially inside Dublin city, while you had the growth of the wonderful suburbs and uh, around Dublin, uh, where the wealthy, uh, the wealthy that hadn't relocated to, to London moved out to these wonderful 
uh, suburbs, uh, there was a huge contrast and an even wider chasm then be, be, between the lives of these people in these leafy suburbs they became to be known and the people living in the inner city. Uh, so Victorian Dublin was not a very pleasant place to be in, but it's, it, it's, it has its own stories. And one of the, 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 the important things about Victorian Dublin is that it was a, a, a hotbed of what they'd call sedition. And, you know, you the, you the Young Ireland movement, you had the later, you had the, the Fenian movement, uh, you even had the Orange Order uh, established in Dublin. Uh, you, then you had the, the, the Fenians and you, the Gaelic Revival, and they were all based in Dublin, centred in Dublin, and largely it was it was a, a, a Dublin intellectuals that led these the, the, these these movements. And the Gaelic Revival is a really interesting one because um, it, it at the end of the the nineteenth century it wasn't just simply an Irish phenomenon, but it seems to be something that happened all over, especially all over Europe, where people began to look back into their own history, way back into their history, and sort of realised that you know while they were being colonized or were, were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the British Empire or whatever, the French Empire, that they had a history all of their own that had largely, and a culture of their own, that had largely been subsumed. So it, it, maybe it was the rise in education, university education and so on, but there certainly was a, a, something stirring within Europe and that was reflected in Dublin as well, in places like Trinity College where people began to study, the, the, you know, the, where the Irish language was failing all over the, in, in the rest of Ireland, uh, it was people through immigration and poverty and so on, uh, and people wanting their children to be able to get jobs, and so to get jobs they had to speak English, and so Irish was going down in popularity in the rest of the country. It's interesting that in Dublin, this revival was taking place, and it wasn't just an interest in the Irish language, there was an interest in Irish culture, in, in, in poetry, and in, in, in in legends and so on. In fact, one of the legends dear to the sorrows is how I get my name, Oinla O'Neill, Oinla, as one of the, the sons of, of, of Ishnach, Nisha, Arden and Oinla. So again, there was a revival in, in the, the, uh, calling children by Irish names. And in, uh, you know, even people with, 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 uh, with English names were now starting to gaelicize, if there's a word, their own names. And, you know, there were lots of O's and mocks and so on. And there was a great pride. And of course, that was also reflected in the rise of the GAA uh, and the Gaelic League. And they were two of the major, major factors that fed into this, this Gaelic revival. And in another way, the Gaelic revival was very, very important because uh, people, the Fenians, are the, are the, 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 uh, what we'd call the, the, the rump of the Fenians that hadn't been arrested uh, during the, the Fenian rebellion, formed an organization called the IRB. And the IRB tapped very, very quickly into this idea of the Gaelic Revival as well. So they were sort of offering the whole package, if you like, of not only free, but Irish as well, not only Irish, but free as well. And it became a sort of a mantra for them. And it, through the, the Gaelic League and the GAA, the IRB were able to infiltrate these organizations and get a new recruits and so on. And I mean, this led ultimately on to the, the, the planning of, of the 1916 rebellion and so on, and the leadership of the, the War of Independence, and ultimately to the foundation of, of, of the Free State. So it's, it, 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 it brings the whole thing then well into, into, the, into the 20th century and up to what I call modern times. Now, I hope that's given you a, a, a flavor of what the course is like. Um, it's, it, it's very hard to, to get an idea of it with just bullet points, but I was trying to just give some sort of a flavor of it because anybody who's done the course, I hope will tell you that it's, it's much more conversational, it's much more relaxed, it's enjoyable, it involves a lot of maps and, and documents and so on. Uh, and it's, it's hopefully it, it, it can be done face to face, but if not, it, can be, it will be done by, by Zoom, I hope. And my next slide, the final slide, is just an outline of the five walks associated with the the course uh, now, which I should have there, and I, I actually don't. Sorry, that that slide is not coming up. So my my apologies. Okay, so I'm sorry about that, but I'll actually give you a run through what, what the what the actual walks are. The first walk takes us basically through Viking Dublin. It's that area we start at uh, Dublin Castle, and it goes roughly around the what what would have been the walls of of of. Uh, early medieval Dublin, and we finish up in Christchurch. The second one then takes us into what we call 
loosely we call it Norman Dublin, and it starts it, it, it starts outside the castle again. We go through the castle, Dublin Castle, we come out, and we, we weave our way around to uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was, the, was the, 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 an important part of medieval Dublin. The third, uh, the third walk then is what I call the I call it the Grafton Street Walk because it starts off with a parliamentary theme of the, the uh, Houses of Parliament in uh, College Green and it brings us up through a very, very interesting part of Dublin around the Grafton Street area and we end up in Stevens Green. The fourth walk then is, um, my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm getting one of those senior moments. <laughs> um, fourth walk, where's the fourth walk? I definitely do a fourth walk. Um, Oh, sorry, the fourth walk, of course, sorry. The fourth walk uh, involves a walk a, a, along um, O'Connell Street. It starts at O'Connell Monument. We take in the, the monuments at O'Connell Street and we then go by the Garden of Remembrance and so on and we end up around Dorset Street. And the final walk is one of the walks that I think people enjoy the most because it's the bridges of Dublin and we start off at one of the earliest bridges and we make our way down all the way down to uh, the customs house and it, it is a huge amount can be learned from the quays and from the from the bridges of Dublin on how Dublin developed and so on how the trade developed and it's uh, it, it's the, it's our final walk now just before I hand back to Enya I just want to maybe you you, you read the blurb where I uh, where I to, to sort of publicize the, the, the course and quench your interest I asked um, where could you find a a, a place that has got two men with four streets called after them. Um, what street is called after, and a street called after an Anglo-Saxon's daughter. A place where you would find a, a five wise and five foolish virgins. Where you would find a shopping centre on the uh, site of a leper hospital. And uh, where you would hear about uh, uh, somebody who walked to Jerusalem for a bet. So I can put you out of your misery. Maybe you've got all these answers already. The two men with the four streets. The first man was a man called Frederick, Duke of Nassau. And he was one of the people that, that came and settled in at, after the Williamite uh, Wars. And he had Duke Street, Nassau Street, North Frederick Street, and South Frederick Street called after him. He wasn't a, a bashful man. The other man was a very interesting man, and he, we bring, he brings it north side of the city because uh, his name was Henry Moore. And he was the Earl of Drogheda. So we had Henry Street, Moore Street, North Earl Street, and Drogheda Street is what is what uh, O'Connell Street was called even before it was known as Sackville Street. So he had the, 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 the two men. The Anglo-Saxon's daughter is St. Werberg, and that's Werberg Street. And it's very unusual because uh, it's it's somebody, it's a chief, an Anglo-Saxon chief, and actually had no connection with Dublin, but you'll have to come on one of the walks to find out why. The church was established there. The leper hospital was the, le the leper hospital of St. Stephen's. So next time you're in the Stephen's Green Centre, you'll see there's a double reason for, 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 uh, uh, for, for sanitising your hands, not just COVID-19, but the fact that, that there were many poor lepers there uh, that died on the, on the, the site where, where you're uh, doing your shopping. And the final one is a, a, the man who walked to Jerusalem was during the height of the of the Georgian period when I spoke about people, the very, very wealthy people. This man called Buck Whaley, who was the son of a, a, a very wealthy man, and Buck Whaley was so wealthy through his father's endeavours that he never had to work himself. And he did accept a bet from his friends to walk to Jerusalem. Now, I'm not sure how long it took him, but he brought a large entourage with him. And I don't know how long, as I say, but he, he obviously won the bet because uh, it was it was uh, recounted in the in the annals of, of his, uh, his Stevens Green Club that he had done that. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'd again like to thank you very much for, your, for your, your attention and to encourage you to, if you don't do this course, to do one of the many, many interesting courses that are put on by, by the Adult Education Centre. They, they do a wonderful job and it's a wonderful way to meet people and to get new information and so on. So, thank you. Over to Enya. Thanks a million, Anna. That was lovely. Um, and I just want to say thanks so much. I know it's really hard to talk 
to yourself on these things. So you have no interaction. You don't. You can't see people's faces. So I know that's really hard. So thank you. And um, now let me have a look. There was a few questions that popped in. If anybody wants to ask a question, you can type it in now, and we can answer it live. Um, and if you're raising your hand, it perhaps you can even type in the question. That'd be perfect. Um, somebody asked if it was going to be recorded. Yeah, Anla kindly gave us permission to record the session today. So as soon as we have it captioned, we'll be popping it up live and up onto our YouTube page. Um, and I'll send you. A, I'll send anybody who registered for the for the webinar today. I'll send them a link to the to the video to watch it. Geraldine gave a lovely recommendation to say that on, that she loved Anna's courses before and is now a national tourist guide. <laughs> so that's Great. it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. <laughs> nice, nice to hear that. <laughs> the enrollment, the next enrollment will be happening in, we usually, we usually kick it off in August. Obviously, we'll be waiting to hear from university management more about the social distancing requirements to see if, what kind of format the courses will be on. Um, but we'll be broadcasting any information about the lifelong learning courses on the website. So it's www.ucd.ie forward slash ALL. So we'll have any updates at the moment. We're not sure how the courses will look in autumn. But as soon as we know, we'll let you know as well. And it'll all be, it'll all be on the website. Now, let me have a look at this. Um, Anne Murray wanted to know who are the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Oh, thank you very much. I, I could say as a, as a former principal, I was waiting for that. I was just testing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. As you go up O'Connell Street, and if you come from the O'Connell Bridge end, and you go past the GPO, look up to your left, and you'll see, uh, I think, I'm not sure what's there now, but it was the old National Irish Bank. And up in the, in, in the impediment of that, the triangular section at the top, you'll see the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. Now, that was originally a, an insurance company when it was built in the 19th century. And the idea was that every, in those days, everybody did Bible studies in school and so on. So people were very, very familiar with the parable of the, the five wise and the five uh, foolish virgins, that it was traditional in, in, in the time of Jesus that 10 virgins would be uh, called upon to uh, provide light for the uh, wedding party as they arrived from the synagogue to the place where they were, where they were going to have their, their celebrations. Uh, and they would be there, they would be given lamps and so on and oil. And the idea was that when they heard that the, that the party was coming, they would light these lamps and there would, be, there would be five on one side, five on the other, and then they would be welcomed into the feast. Uh, there were five very wise virgins who stayed with their lamps and waited until they got the call. There were five foolish virgins. I don't know what the five foolish virgins were up to, but they weren't looking after their lamps. And when the call came, the groom were on their way. The five wise virgins had their lamps lit. The five foolish virgins hadn't time to do it. So the five wise virgins were welcomed inside the, the, the uh, wedding feast, and the five foolish virgins were locked outside. And this was obviously... A, a reference to who got into heaven and who didn't. But the insurance company took it as the idea that if you were a wise virgin, you would take out insurance. If you were a foolish virgin, you'd leave it at the last minute, and then, of course, you couldn't get insurance. So it was a very early advertising, uh, a, a very nice, subtle sort of advertising uh, platform for the insurance company. So thank you for that. I'm sorry I forgot to mention it. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. <laughs> And the people are wondering what, how many hours per week the course typically is, when and if it's, when it's face to face. If okay, you know. right. So it's very simply answered. It's 7 to 9 p.m. on Thursdays and then a 10 to 12 on, on Saturday mornings. And it runs over five weeks, so it's quite compressed. That's perfect. And there's usually one in spring and one in autumn. Um, there is, yes, that's right. We, this last week, I believe it was, we started to do a few of our lifelong learning courses that had been cancelled when the lockdown happened. So we have moved them on to Zoom as well. So we're getting that, we're getting used to that format as well. So if that's how it would look like in autumn, that might be how, how we do it as well. So if it's a smaller group, it's the Zoom, um, it's the Zoom meeting where it's more, we can see more faces. And if it's a, the larger group, it's like this. Now. And we'll obviously have to work out something about the walks then as well, Anya. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But seeing, the, seeing they're all in the <laughs> open air, it should be okay. <laughs> Deirdre as well, um, praises you from on a height as well, Anna. She went to oh, 
questions before? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm blushing here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the website again, thanks Ellen for asking. It's www.ucd.ie forward slash ALL. But when I send out the YouTube link, I'll, have the, I'll link the lifelong learning page into the email as well. And the course that we were speaking about was walks and talks that Anna does with us on the lifelong learning program. Um, if, if we do move the courses online, Jacqueline, from the US in, in, in America, um, you will be able to attend, obviously, if it is online at that point. And let me just make sure I get all these questions right. Um, there's a question here, Anna, and they want to know, do you go into how people lived um, and how ordinary people added arts that existed in countries over the centuries? I hope yes, I absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a balance between the sort of the ruled and the ruling classes. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge amount of, of social history involved in it. And as I say, a lot of the themes that I, I, I cover in the first course, I pick them up and, and I pick them up the strands in the second course and I can span them, I expand them more. But it's very, very much about ordinary people as well as the, it's not just a sort of dates and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, uh, talking about people's, uh, the, the wealthy people and so on. It's, it's very much a sort of a social look at Dublin. Thank you for that. Thanks, Anna. Um, the price range, they typically range from about 160 euro to 195, but all that will be in the brochure um, next year. Now, let me just make sure. The start of the course usually, usually kick off in October. Would I be right to say that, Anna? It's, yes, usually the last Thursday in September, usually that's my benchmark. Oh, yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> I, I, I try to get it done before the sort of bad weather sets in on touch wood. Uh, we've been over the over the years. We've been very lucky with the weather, as as, as former attendees will tell you, that the weather isn't as bad as we think it is in in, in you know in October, November. But when you get into December, you're you're into bad weather. So we try and get it done early, no finished in early November. Yeah, that's that's perfect. It is funny. You always expect like I I tend to do a bit of sport outside, and you always expect the weather to be much worse than what it is. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, another person is wondering if they could get an update by email about the courses. In the email as well, um, I'll send you the link to sign up for the mailing list for the lifelong learning courses and the updates are done for that. So when the, bro when the brochure is published, it'll be done through the mailing list. So that might be the handiest way to find out information on that. And then the location of Anna's course, the Thursday nights are in UCD um, when, when it's physical, when it's a physical course, the Thursday nights are in UCD and then the Saturday, as Anna mentioned, is out and about in, in Dublin City. Um, and with the spring course on it, when is that one? Yeah, the spring course again usually starts at the end of January and runs into early March, so it's five Thursdays, five Saturdays. Yeah. And it's called right. oh, no. More Walks and Talks, very imaginatively. Thanks, Anna. I think that that's all the questions. I'll go through them again. And if I've missed any, I'll email you directly because I have your um, contact details as well. But thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for joining. This has been absolutely lovely. It's nice to have seen. Um, oh, I just see one more question. Is there parking in UCD in the evenings? Yeah, UCD, that's typically why we have the lifelong learning courses in the evenings um, because the parking permit ends and there usually are spaces. All the students have kind of upped and left at that point by the time the lifelong learning course starts. It usually starts at time of seven and there is parking available. I can attest to that. <laughs> but that's it. Now, Anna, I've, you're gone frozen, but I'm not sure if it's my connection or if it's your connection. But maybe we'll end it there. And I'll go through the questions. Any, oh, yeah, Anna, I lost Anna. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. I'll end the session here now. And as I said, I'll send all the information on email as soon as we have it up and running. Um, and the general, if you have any other inquiries, the general email address to contact us is all at ucd.ie. But thank you again so much. Take care. Best wishes. <laughs>